Hey class, it's Bill Berry here with the week 8 demo. We're going to start talking about more intricate object manipulations and this week we're focused on class inheritance and method overrides. We'll carry this example through to next week by the way as well because there's still more topics to talk about with objects so we've got a lot to do with this demo but we'll get started with the basic stuff in this area. <clears throat> so let's look really briefly at what we've done in the past with objects and their behaviors. So far all all of our classes that we've had where we've worked with more than one class at a time or we've used that class in a testing method or in main, so far all of our class relationships have been what we'd call has a relationships. For instance, we had a main class that instantiated that had a pizza. So main had a pizza or in our bake shop example you created bakery orders and the bake shop had orders. So a bake shop has an order, a bakery order. So if we look at our uh, in BlueJay at our class browser, what it's really drawing for us is a UML class diagram, right? They're simplified. They're not showing all of the methods and all of the instance variables, but it doesn't matter. They're still showing us a relationship of the objects, but they have shown them with dotted lines and a very, you know, line type arrowhead that's not solid, not filled in. That's how it represents has a relationships. So that's what we've seen so far with our object our little object diagram, our little class browser that we see in BlueJay. But we're looking now at a new kind of relationship. The kind of relationship that we're going to study starting this week is an is a relationship. So instead of has a, now we're on to is a. Now, you're going to use both of these in real life, so it's nothing. there's nothing wrong with has a relationships, but <clears throat> it gets much more interesting when we work in the is a world. So we're uh, some examples from real life. If, think of something being a type of something else. For instance, a truck is a vehicle. It has some differences. It's not, it's not a just a generic vehicle. A truck is a little different, but it certainly is a class. It's a type of vehicle. A giraffe is a mammal and a tire is a car part. So if you think of it, you can express a hierarchy where each thing is a something else. So at the bottom right here, you can see we have a bank account, right? That's a generic bank account which has certain attributes and behaviors. Um, a checking account is a bank account, yes. A savings account is a bank account, yes. And a CD is a special type of savings account. So a CD is a savings account and a savings account is a bank account. And you can have these hierarchies that get fairly deep. Each one of these levels can bring to the table new data, right, new instance variables. Each one can bring new methods to the table, right. Certain things happen with a CD that don't happen with a savings account or don't happen with a banking account. So we have a lot of flexibility into bringing in new things to the table. And as we'll see, we can also make changes to things along the line. So we're going to study overriding as well, where we say, yeah, I didn't really like what that was provided in the class above me. Now to the technology or the terminology rather that you hear here is going to be subclass and superclass. So a subclass is a class that is a something else, right? It extends the functionality that is in its superclass. So you will often hear superclass and subclass. And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Now, our specific example that we're going to tackle starting this week is a people example, people at the college. So at the college, we have so far identified two types of people. We have students and we have teachers. Now, we imagine there's going to be a lot more. There's probably going to be some staff. There's going to be other things that are not exactly teachers and students, but that's fine. Uh, for now, we'll just say there's students and teachers in the world. Everybody has associated with them an ID and a name and an email. So that's sort of generic things that are properties of people. And we can imagine the behaviors that are going to be associated with that. We're going to have a lot of typical things like accessors and mutators that deal with that data. So fine, that all makes sense. But let's say that our rules for IDs differ a little bit. So students have a nine digit, always numeric, number, an ID number, but teachers have a six digit number, but that can have digits. It can also have uppercase alpha characters in it. So we see here uh, some of the differences between students and teachers. Even though both have IDs, they have different 
uh, qualifications for those IDs. Also, we have some different behaviors. So for students, we want to maintain a list of courses. So let's, for the moment, make it simple by saying students can take up to 30 courses in their program. So we want to maintain a list of those and their associated grades. So that's some new data, right? Some private data that's going to be maintained for students that's not generic to people. And we also want to be able to get an overall grade average, right? Important things for students. Now, for teachers, we can let them teach up to four courses each term, and we want a way to add a course to that list. So you see here where some of the behavior diverges, but also some of the data diverges. We have certain things, both data and behaviors, that are specific or generic to the person class, and then both students and teachers are going to be derived from, or in the proper terminology here, they're going to extend, in our Java terminology, the person class, and they are going to perhaps override some behavior, and then they're going to add some new behavior and potentially some new data as well. So that's our challenge this week, is figuring out how to tackle that in Java. So that brings us to the point where we're actually going to start coding. So let's do the very, very beginning parts of that, and then we will move forward from there. So look here at our sample that I've set up. We have a main that does nothing interesting yet, and we have a person class. And if I look at the person class, it will be sort of unremarkable to you given that demo introduction. You'll see that I have some instance variables, some private data, string, uh, strings for name and email and ID. Uh, I've just used strings for the moment to make life easy, but of course any data type is fine. Now, one thing that we have not dealt with before. We haven't really paid attention to what this private thing means. We know it has something to do with encapsulation. Uh, we know that we could put public there if we wanted access to this to be very uh, you know, free from the outside world, but we've been putting private on our objects and we're going to understand more about that now. Uh, the next thing is we have a constructor where we set the ID right, to just a blank and empty string. And then we set the name and email from what's passed in, makes sense. I've also created a method called valid ID, where you can pass it an ID and you can say, I want you to validate that and tell me true or false, is that a valid ID in this system? Now, one of the things that's interesting is in the person class, we really don't know what to do here. We don't really have any rules for a generic person's ID. We know that students and teachers have specific rules, but a person doesn't really have a specific rule, so I've just put return true. That's a problem that in the long run we're going to solve, but that might be a next week kind of long-term problem to solve, not this week. I've also had um, created a, a method called set ID, and I check whether it's a valid ID. If it's not, I throw in a legal argument exception. Otherwise, I just store that data. The rest is pretty straightforward. Get ID, get name set name, set email, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, I'm a good uh, Java programmer. I'm always going to provide a two-string method. And I have just created a little string that says ID, name, and email, etc. So it's a very generic class that I've created called person, but it does have behaviors and it does have data. Let's take now the first baby step toward doing this, uh, this next piece, which is to extend the class, which is to create a subclass for a student. So let's do that. We're going to create a new class. I'm going to call it student, and I'm going to say OK. I'm going to put it down here because we know this is going to be a subclass. I might as well show it that way. And now I'm going to simply double click that guy and I'm going to put it up here in the corner. Uh, forgive me for not doing a lot of Java docs. I'm trying to save some room here. In fact, I'm just going to delete all this stuff so we start fairly clean. All right, now we know we're going to have a constructor, so I'm going to say public um, student. But before we even do that, let's take care of the actual thing of saying that this is a subclass. And the way that we do that is we say it extends person. All right, we're saying that this student is a subclass of person, or it extends person and adds new functionality in this subclass. So now, one of the things that's interesting is we might start with a very generic kind of constructor, but it's not going to be happy with us, right? You might think that this would compile, but it's going to say, I'm not entirely happy with your constructor here. The problem is, it's important that the constructor here is, is always the first line of the constructor always relies on the parent class or on the super class. So we want a line here that always calls super 
right? That's the superclass, and I always have to pass it what the superclass wants. So it always wants, um, in fact, let's go look and see what it wants to make absolutely sure. Person wants a name and an email. So student is needing to call super with a name and an email. Well, we don't have a name and an email, so I guess we better pull it in here. String name, string email. Right? It doesn't have to be the same names, but we have to pass along that same data. Now, it would be okay if we had a constructor that took something else in, right? For instance, an age. We could certainly have a constructor that's more rich, but we, the first line of the constructor of a subclass needs to call the superclass, and it needs to pass along that data. Because, think about it, when you are instantiating a student, you are also kind of, in the background, instantiating a person, right? You are creating a student, but a student student is a person. So there are parts of a person that are actually calling, being called into action here as well. So that's the first rule, is that you've got to always call first line. Now, the error messages here won't make a lot of sense. It might seem strange to you, but it's basically complaining about, hey, you need to have a constructor that calls the super class right away. And that's all we have to do to create a person extension a subclass called student. Now, fun part is let's go just very first very quickly prove that we can instantiate a student so if I now say uh, I want a student class called test student and I create him by saying I want a new student and I'm gonna call it you know Bobby Brown and I'm going to pass an email Bobby at Comcast.net okay so I have a student and I have created a new object and set it to an object reference. It thinks everything is fine. Now, how can I prove that that thing's actually working? Well, interestingly, I can just do something like this, system.out.println, and I want to print out test student. Well, how's that going to work? Well, I'm, I'm actually calling behind the scenes, right? I'm calling uh, to string if I do this, right? Well, how's that going to work? Student doesn't have a two-string method. Well, this is exactly the magic that's going to happen here. What's going to happen is Java's going to say, hey, I'm trying to find a two-string method. Student, do you have a two-string method? Student doesn't have one, right? But it's going to then walk up the inheritance chain and say, hey, let me go to the superclass. If the superclass has one, that's just as good, and I'll use that. For every method that's called, it does that. Does this class have one? If so, use that. If not, walk up the chain and find one and then use that. So we're going to see that with very little code, we can run this thing. And let me clear that because it has some old stuff in it that I was working on. OK, here we go. All right, so we have no ID, but there's our Bobby Brown. And in fact, easy enough, we can even call, this is a great, a great example, teststudent.setID, and I can set his ID, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now, we don't have any rules yet, right? We know that that's a part we still need to solve, but we do have this working. And you'll see there's the ID, here's the new stuff that I just did. So where does it get that? How do I call toString when I don't have a toString method again, or a setID method? The setID method is in the superclass, so it's happy to walk up and find the next one available up the chain, and it's in the person class. So this shows us in this introductory video, we talked about the concept, we talked about this general idea of superclasses and subclasses, which implies inheritance, right? If dad has it, I can just use dad's. And so we have now seen how we can use inheritance to use some of the methods like set ID, and we can also call the toString method, right? Because those are both in the parent class. Now, interestingly, what we cannot do is the following. You notice that in the person class, I have things like ID and name and email. So can I, in, the, in this other class, can I now say test student or even, yeah, not, not in here, that's not a good example. Let's go to the student class. In the student class, can I say ID equals blank, right? Is it something that I can do here? And it's gonna say, you know what? I can't let you at ID because yes, I know it's in the super class. I know it's in person, but guess what? 
it's marked private. You know how your dad might have a little locked box in his desk for some personal financial stuff? Well, it's locked, and just because you're his kid doesn't mean you get access to it. It's still locked. So if it says private up there in the superclass, you can't get to it here either. That could be a little bit of a problem. There's ways around that, but in general, we don't want to get around it. We want to say, look, if it's private, methods are provided for you to access these things, you got to use the method. So you need to use get ID and set ID and things like that so that you go through the proper channels. It's private data, even the subclasses, it's still private to the subclasses. Now I think I'll stop here because that's a lot to take in at the moment and I want you to stop and think about how this general concept works and how this little bit of code that we wrote in main even though it doesn't it has things that are not in the student class all of this still works now that handles a little bit of the the idea of inheritance and we still have to handle the idea of an override of uh, a child class a subclass changing the behavior that was defined in the parent class but we'll get to that in the next video stop ponder uh, play a little bit if you want to and then we'll continue in the next video so thanks for watching this one